Yeah, it's been a fantastic move over to Duolingo and, and working with the, the team with the Duolingo English Test. It's just an amazing opportunity for students to undertake an accessible test, which is trusted by over 5,000 institutions globally and do it in, in a manner that they, they can access online anytime on demand. Hi, I'm Dirk Mulder, coming to you from Wadjuk Noongar country in Perth, Western Australia. And g'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society, coming to you from Garrigal Land in Sydney today. And Dirk, major news drop this week, genuine student tests. Tell me about it. What's going on? Yeah, Rob, the Department of Home Affairs released a provider update, which they're now looking at bringing out the, the new genuine student test. And for those of you that aren't up to date in this area, which hopefully you will be, one of the major recommendations out of the review season that happened in the last six months of last year was that the genuine temporary entrant test was going to be replaced by a genuine student test. So that's now been announced and they're looking at rolling it out from the 23rd of March, which that's is soon. in three days time yeah. from when we're... Yep. So from when when we're taping this, it'll be coming out literally the day after this goes to air. So short lead time, mate. That's probably been the the, the, the biggest pushback. And it's been interesting because it's been, you know, from an institutional perspective, you've got to think about, you know, your systems, your processes, all of those things. If it does release on the 23rd of March or shortly thereafter, institutions would be scrambling at the moment in terms of their assessment methodologies and, and those sorts of things to ensure that students are doing the right things to not mess up their SSVF placements. Agents, on the other hand, probably a little bit more relaxed around timeframes because they're not on the hook for the SSVF uh, program. But as an extension of institutions, they'd be working with institutions at the moment, scurrying away, I would imagine. So yeah, so mate, very short lead time, and it's probably pricked up a few ears of people around the sector in terms of that. The second part of that will be the how... It'll be applied offshore versus onshore. And there seems to be a thought base that this genuine student test is going to really look at onshore students and particularly those who may not be on a currently on a student visa. So if you're currently onshore, and Rob, we've spoken about this in the past, if you're onshore and you're on a tourist visa or a graduate visa or a COVID visa and you're wanting to come back into the student system, the view is that this new test will make it make that possibly more difficult. So we'll see how that runs over the next couple of months. But with the with the invent and with the implementation of this, that's one thing to look out for. Are there any details yet about the 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 changes? So what's different between the genuine temporary entrance test, the GTE, and the genuine yeah, sorry, genuine student test? Help me out. Yeah, so look, there's a there's a series of specific questions now that will be asked, and one of those is around visas and the statement of purpose or the the kind of the general kind of view about why your coming is, is being dropped. So that kind of general why you're coming to Australia, why you're studying, all of that is being replaced by a series of questions. And certainly, if you jump on the koalanews.com, you can you can see stories based around that. But yeah, so so that's what's happening in that space. Just as you were talking there, it made me think about. AI and when government might start asking questions that are scanned by <laughs> AI. The reason is because we've got a guest coming in later working in a company that does this use AI true. very, very well. So it's just the, no, you, you, those, you, you're very right. Those things just you're get up right, in my mate. mind, like asking students or getting into video themselves and talk about their rationale for coming to Australia and having AI, you know, scan that and j judge intent and stuff like that. So it's all coming our way. Absolutely. No, mate, it's, it can't be far away, can it? I mean, you've got to be thinking that this is this is going to be, you know, computer assessed very, very shortly and take out some of the subjectivity that we're seeing across the uh, the immigration network at the moment to make it a bit more objective. The big thing, I guess, on the back of that question that you just asked is that there will be two ministerial directions that will be released. So we're holding our breath and, and waiting for those to be released. And again, by the time this goes to air, there'll be a couple of day turnaround and it may well, those those ministerial directions may even drop in that period of time. So that's something to, to look out for and certainly is what I'm looking at at the moment. Something just very interesting about, I think, those ministerial directions because they're an important part of like the legislative framework. So for those people who aren't Correct. sort of familiar, you have the parliament will pass a law which has a whole bunch of conditions mm -hmm. in it, but then the, the law can actually provide this sort of space where the minister gets to make some decisions too. And so ministerial yeah. directions become very important because they can be updated far more quickly and easily than a Correct. full legislative process. So I'm always curious to see what gets 
brought into those documents because that actually become becomes something that institutions, organisations, the industry can lobby more easily on if we need to make changes or need to advocate for changes. So very curious to see what, what comes out. Yeah, well, that's right. And in ministerial direction, I think from off the top of my head of 107, which was passed in December that O'Neill brought down, that, that was really the one that's created this kind of anxiety in the in the visa system where applications are now being processed based on assessment levels. So assessment level one will get priority over assessment level two. And if you're in assessment level three, well, hold your breath and you can wait a couple of months. Um, and that that's it, it was that change in that ministerial direction that, that led to that. So you're absolutely right, ministerial directions add direction, they add interpretation or, or, or guidance on interpretation of legislation and prioritisation in many cases. So yeah, watch this space and that's the thing to look out for. Before I go into it in too much detail, there's, there's two major acronyms, I guess, that are at play here. So one is a genuine uh, GTE, which is a genuine temporary entrant. So prior to the release of this new GST, which is a genuine student test, students operated under the GTE regime. And that meant that they needed to demonstrate that they were a genuine, a genuine temporary entrant and a non-stayer in the country beyond their, their student. We're now taking away that GTE element and moving to a GST where students now need to demonstrate through a series of questions that they are a genuine student not necessarily a genuine entrant. These two major areas feed into what we call the SSVF, which is the Student Streamlined Visa Processing Framework, um, which essentially when a student applies for a visa and if they're not adhering to the visa uh, areas, the institution can will be assessed as level one, two or three. Level one is the highest level where essentially the majority of their students have have worked with the visa regime and they are in essentially doing the right thing. Assessment level two is where a student might, they may have a, a larger cohort of students that may either move off of that visa into another sector or do other things, return home early, et cetera, et cetera, but not comply with the full amount of their visa. And assessment level three, obviously, are institutions who have cohorts that aren't necessarily doing well in that, in that framework. One of the points that I do want to raise, though, and one that I think is either either hasn't been picked up or maybe glossed over, I've mentioned it to a few people, kind of you know, in an off the record kind of setting. If SSVF is is based upon the GTE setting, and we're now removing the GTE setting and moving to a GST setting, my question or my kind of thought bubble for the moment is: How relevant are the current SSVF assessment levels? So if you're in a less assessment level two and you've been branded an assessment level two based on a GTE setting, when this new system comes into place, my question, I guess, broadly is, is it unfair that you are continue, that you are continuing as an assessment level two based on a previous system or setting when there's a new base level to the, to the current system? So my question would be, and it's still out there at the moment for consideration as to whether SSVF standings are paused, iced for the moment, or I think that there's a third option where they could be recalibrated over a period of three to six months to see how institutions now operate within this new GST kind of framework, if I can put it that way, even though the SSVF is the framework, but but the core, the core valuation of that is the move from the GTE to the GST. Can they be recalibrated? I don't know. I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense to say, we've got a new system. How about we all kind of start at an assessment level one and those who are performing ones, those who are performing well stay there. Those who aren't performing well, well, then you might drop down and you might be penalised into the future. But there's a lot of voices out there at the moment that are now saying, well, is the SSVF even, is it doing what it was designed to do? And, and they're all very good questions because the last few months has been quite chaotic and I'm not sure that the SSVF has enabled clarity around that. It's probably added more to some of that complexity and, and chaos. So i what we really need to do is watch over the next week or two as the government uh, implements the GST and we'll see how we go. On to more news. There have been a couple of announcements on the abroad front. A teachers, who we had Liam on not long ago, and CIS Australia, everyone knows Brad Dorohy. They've announced their winter programs and some of their application dates. Rob, as someone who, I guess, owned a third party abroad company, I find these initiatives really, really important because it gives students just so much more choice in terms of an abroad experience, their destination, what might actually you know, be 
all encompassing around that experience. As an expert in this area, what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely an important contributor to learning abroad in, in general. Obviously, students have got their own interests, disciplines, and they might want to be doing mm. very specific types of overseas study experiences and having external organisations in the mix there along with universities' own study tours, exchange programs, internships, practical experiences overseas, I think is, is a really good, healthy thing. And yeah, as, as you noted, for many years, I was running a, an organisation called AIM Overseas, which was, I loved, loved that company, you know, thousands and thousands of students having amazing experiences. Didn't make it through COVID, but fortunately, the landscape has maintained a couple of really great providers, as you said, CIS Australia and Achiches, the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies. And those deadlines, yeah, coming up coming up right now. So if you like, the two main periods of the year when students here in Australian universities will go and have overseas learning abroad experiences, typically the mid-year holidays and the end-of-year holidays, not exclusively, but typically. So those deadlines coming up in the next sort of couple of weeks is a really crunch time for institutions to, to get behind their promotional efforts to make sure that students have access to those to those opportunities. So yeah, very, very busy time of year. I always used to look forward to March because you had like this short window of three weeks to get out <laughs> and get your marketing done, you know, do your student recruitment and then then manage that kind of wave of applications. And I really do think that it, it's a valuable service to institutions who are also going through exactly the same thing right now. They're dealing with their own waves of exchange and, and short-term applications for, for the mid-year holidays. The other thing that's coming up in, in learning abroad, the most recent benchmarking learning abroad study is being completed at the moment. So Study Move mm-hmm. are doing that on behalf of the Australian Universities International Directors Forum, the AUIDF. And I do believe that there's a on, an online session coming up regarding the BLA results on the 5th of April. I was in touch just recently with Kerry Ramirez from Study Move. And going to have him or a representative on the podcast in the next couple of weeks to to mm. talk about the benchmarking survey. As as you know well, Dirk, institutions have been benchmarking for the better part of two decades, over two decades now, comparing their operations yep. both across inbound, international fee recruitment and the like, as well as learning abroad. That whole process started with the the, the, the great Alan Olson, Australia's legendary. Yeah, um, mate, I was consultant. I was actually on the AUIDF when we when we voted to incorporate. Is that, that. So, right? Um, I, 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 yeah, I remember it well. And isn't it funny? Like now, Alan Olson is writing for the Koala. There you go. It's mm. funny how these things come full circle. An amazing piece of piece piece of historical data collecting. I mean, that that goes back over two decades. Mm. So, a respect to yeah, to absolutely. you and the whole whole pe- team of people on the AUIDF back then to have the foresight to invest in that in that data and that that continues continues this day so learning abroad results information coming out very soon and stay tuned on global horizons for more on the learning abroad benchmarking it's always fascinating i'm i'm fascinated to see has learning abroad have outbound australian student numbers or, or, you know, student numbers rebounded to where they were post covid you know they were already bouncing back on the last survey it'll be fascinating to see we were up to about 55,000 outbound students out of Australia heading overseas in 2019. So will we be back there or very close to it? I, I, I definitely hope hope so. Me too. Me too. Anyway, that's my little learning abroad rant. A uh, couple of other last little things that you've, you've got here, Dirk, a few little interesting stats and things coming up. Absolutely. Just made just two two really quick points. IDP announced the the opening of their Canberra office. So they're returning to Canberra after after many years. I believe it's now their seventh office nationally that's student facing. So welcome back to Canberra. I do believe IDP was established in Canberra back in the day. So it's nice to see them back in the nation's capital and and supporting students in, in different ways there. And then lastly, the Ministry of Education in China put out a press release a little bit over a week ago and it announced the number of students that are in higher ed and that includes their higher ed definition includes vocational studies, I believe. But mate, the number's astronomical. 47 million students sitting in higher ed at the moment, and that's up 1.08 million on 2023. So if we think we've got problems with students, and I shouldn't say problems, if we think we've got a lot of students, that's probably the better way to phrase it. Mate, just look to China because that's phenomenal. Yeah, almost almost double the Australian population in, in education. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, there's been a lot of talk over the last 10 years around the investment that the Chinese government has been making into higher education. And we've seen, you know, Chinese institutions rocketing up the global rankings 
and and ratcheting up at, at just a phenomenal rate research output innovation i mean it's all going through the roof and with i mean that volume of students you can imagine there's a lot of incredibly smart talented people in that pool shows that china still has like this enormous advantage just in terms of population to be able to continue to drive I mean. it's a con- common it's it's economy it's innovation forward so yep, good on them for sure I can only imagine absolutely. Only imagine the bureaucracy that's involved in trying to keep that whole ship running. <laughs> Good on them. Good on them. Absolutely. Well, I'm extremely excited about our next guest. And if I can tell you a little story, Dirk, this morning when I went downstairs to my kitchen, my kids came down. I was making lunches, and they said, "Hey, have you done your Joe Lingo yet today?" And so I went, "Oh no, I haven't done it yet." So I jumped on and you know worked my way through my exercise. And right at the end, mate, this is dead set true. And if anybody's watching this on the podcast, I just knocked up my four-year streak today. So this is possibly the best guest for the day for me. Who have we got on? Rob, mate, we're very fortunate to have uh, Brett Blacker on today. Brett, obviously, mate, very well known in the industry, comes with a resume that's probably second to none. But most of all, I'm really fortunate to call him a you know a colleague and a, and a really, really good friend. For those few out there that may not have heard of Brett before, Brett has oh, in excess of 20 years in international education. He, you know, at a very young age, was a mover and shaker. He's been director at two universities, Murdoch University and the University of Newcastle in the international space. He made, he made it to the top of the IAA as president and most recently for oh, just shy of 10 years, I think, has been the CEO of English Australia, one of the major peak bodies here in international education in Australia. So, Brett, welcome. It's great to have you on board. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. That's a very kind introduction. And thanks, Rob. It's it's great to be here with you both. Congratulations on the podcast. Been been listening along and you guys have been doing a great job. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Mate, before we probably move on to, you know, what you're up to, like right at this present moment, if we just look back, I, can I ask the question, 20 years in international education, what are some of the highlights that you've that you've had along the way? Oh, great question, Dirk. Yeah, I've been very fortunate, obviously, to be able to sort of work in, in different spheres of the international education landscape here in Australia. You know, the work within higher education at the universities that you noted was, was incredibly great experiences in terms of being able to see that transformational change in students, developing new markets, working with you know, offshore partners, and agents. And, and then obviously when you do have those students coming through from that initial orientation through to their graduation, they're, they're always very special moments. Outside of that, you know, as you noted, I've sort of been fortunate to also have that commercial experience working with Allianz in the overseas student health cover area. And then more recently with English Australia, I guess in, in, in that journey with English Australia, you know, the English language sector is such a critical component of international education. The proficiency of students, you know, when they enter into their academic course or indeed coming out here to Australia and studying English as a standalone course, you know, making, you know, back in, in 2022, Australia, the most highest number of, of student weeks studied of any English language teaching destination in the world. So you know, that journey was filled with, with you know, great moments. There was obviously some, some very difficult and challenging points along the way, but to see the resilience of, of the, the English language sector in particular was, was a really rewarding component of that, that period that I've had. Yeah, and I look at if you know to probably let the cat out of the bag for those that, that aren't in the English sector. I was very fortunate to work with you on a project through the COVID area where you know English Australia was successful in petitioning the government for two nine million dollar funds, the Innovation Fund twenty twenty one and the Innovation Development Fund, which really kept in the first fund private higher education colleges and English language colleges, and in the second fund English language colleges exclusively going through the COVID period and transitioning from an onshore teaching model to an online teaching. Model. Model as well. So again, I'm really fortunate to have seen some of the behind the scenes stuff and seen you in action in, in that space. And mate, all I can say is congratulations on a, on a stellar career in that space and, and now moving obviously into a new and exciting space. So tell us a little bit about transition. Beginning of the year, you, you resigned from English Australia and have started as heading up Duolingo in across Australia and New Zealand. How's, uh, how's that transition been? 
Yeah, it's been tremendous. To be honest, Dirk, I, I was kind of fortunate in my capacity as the CEO of English Australia. I was invited to to go over to Duolingo headquarters last May. Annually, the organisation runs its own internal conference, DETCon, and as a guest of, of the, the organisation, along with other colleagues from, from Australia and New Zealand, had the opportunity to go and sort of I guess, have a look under the hood before, you know, in, in a different lens, looking at it from the English Australia's point of view. That that experience itself was was really illuminating to me, looking at the, the I guess, behind the scenes with the organisation, Duolingo's mission, which, you know, I think was something that was really struck out to me, you know, where they're looking to, I guess, under the mission sort of to develop the best education in the world and, and make it universally available. And, you know, I think that is the heart of a lot of the work that they they do. Equally, seeing where the, the test was at, the Duolingo English test in terms of its innovation, utilising AI and really just coming at it sort of a digital first environment was, was a really great educational experience. So I had sort of many months back in the role at English Australia before this opportunity came along. And I'm guess really pleased uh, in many ways to, to say sort of a few months into the role with Duolingo, the quality of, of the team, the, the team members, the, the, their commitment to not only the mission, but to servicing students through the DET experience to working with our institutional clients has been second to none. So you know, a, a great first few months and you know, really, really excited about what the opportunity looks like for us moving forward as well. Absolutely. You can I take a little side door there? Like I'm super, super keen to hear more about Geo and, and everything that's kind of in the works. But one of the things that I've really appreciated you about you, Brett, firstly, you're incredibly generous. I still remember the first time I met you, which was at the Cottesloe Beach Hotel in Perth. Sun was going down and uh, here was I like this, this young fella with, with no right to be hanging out with a director. And here's this director who's just as friendly as can be, showing me the warmest welcome to the West that I could have ever hoped for. So that's always stayed with me. But on a professional level, I was always blown away with just, you are the master of meetings. You are absolutely extraordinary at running a meeting. And as somebody that loves good systems and processes and seeing that work practice work really well, have you seen anything? I mean, you know, Duolingo, innovative, I wouldn't call it a startup anymore, like a well-established high-tech business. What have you noticed just in terms of the work front, like the way that the company operates that, that maybe us international educators could take away? That's a, a fantastic question, Rob, and, and thanks for the compliment. Really appreciate it. You know, one, one thing that I've been probably most impressed about with, with Duolingo and, and the way in which the culture works is internally the, the transparency of information and communication. Obviously, as you know, being a tech company, systems incredibly well refined, but we internally there, there's a real culture of openness and I guess I got to experience that when I, when I went over to the event and you know literally having the heads of security heads of proctoring test design just open to ask any questions but behind the scenes it, it's even uh, greater in terms of the way in which information is shared um, collectively through through our systems the way in which we hold our team meetings it, it's a really different behavioral side of uh, operating something that I, I do think could be translated in, into other environments it's it's far more inclusive in terms of information is available there if you want it for anyone, as opposed to setting up a committee structure or a meeting structure where it's by design of who can be let in versus who can't. It's a really free-flowing and, and dynamic environment, which I'm certainly enjoying. So it's just on a really practical level, is, is that like knowledge is stored in a wiki or, or, or what is that sort of knowledge sharing mechanism, if I, if I can ask? Yeah, no, I mean, we, we operate, I guess, largely through sort of a Google platform. But in that Google platform, you know, all documents in terms of you know, open file sharing um, within our systems, it's uh, the use of in that suite Slack, Slack messaging and, you know, really dedicated channels through through Slack, which was new to me. I've certainly caught on quickly. But just, you know, in general, I mean, our CEO, Luis Van Aan, he is the co-founder, um, a truly inspirational leader and somebody that, you know, in terms of his own credibility and what Luis has achieved in his life is, is you know, second, second to none or, or very few. But, you know, Luis is so accessible, you know, in terms of the company and, and same as Severin, our, our co-founder. 
but each time, you know, through through their weekly or um, fortnightly Q and A's or Parliament, where we just have these opportunities to really interact with with all different levels of the organisation, and similarly, just the way in which you know, those leaders, I guess, really walk the walk in terms of the way they are accessible and, and share what's happening within the company as well. Love it. Actually, funnily enough, the other day I was just on YouTube and I got recommended Lewis's TED Talk. So yeah, one of those strange moments where you're like, I'm talking to Brett next week. <laughs> it's strange that this TED Talk is being served to me right now. It was fantastic. So highly recommended to anyone listening. I'm along. telling you, Go- Go- Google's, Google's listening, Rob. Google's listening. Hundred percent, <laughs> uh, Rob. And and likewise, I'd I'd absolutely recommend if anyone hasn't had the opportunity just to to look at that story. Uh, it, it's really compelling. And and again, that that's where the values of the organisation lie um, within sort of that that mission of, of accessibility and you know really breaking down barriers and to be honest it's hard not to to buy into it when you think about that way in which they you know want to try and reduce economic inequality and and how through the app it's been so successful you know since launching on on the app store year after year being the most downloaded education app since since the app store was available and i guess there there is a breadth of accolades that the organization has has achieved over that time but i think staying true to that purpose is is why it's been so successful and it looks like you've got a big fan in rob over there on on his on his app as well 100 percent. four years boys you know actually sorry and i'm sorry to cut you off dirk i know i know you're, you've got the next question line there but before my current four-year streak i was actually i had a five-year streak on spanish as well and then for some reason like they, they pushed an update Something bugs because I'm on the free plan and I, I, I lost my streak at that point. I sort of gave up on it for a few oh, months no. and then came back to it. <laughs> and now I'm gutted because otherwise I'd have a nine-year streak on Duo, which would would have to be in like the top, you know, oh, really? few, few thousand streaks in the, in, in the world. So anyway, that's the way life unfolds. <laughs> Congratulations, Rob. It's, it's fantastic to hear. We'll, we'll have to look into that. I'm sure there's some achievement that you should be earning. Puedo hablar español ahora. With a bad accent. Muy bien, muy bien. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, Brett, you've been now at Duo coming up three months, I guess. P- pivoting now, I guess, you know, we've had some really good insights in terms of what the company is like and, and what attracted you to it. If you look forward over the next sort of 12 to 18 months, what sort of, what sort of journey do you think Duo is going to be taking? And particularly, I mean, I, I guess I probably would you know, lead you to the point that Duo seems to be a lot more well-recognised globally, possibly, than what it is here in Australia. And I imagine that one of your major tasks will be getting that familiarity with Duo, with Duo in the Australian education sector. Is that kind of fair to say? Yeah, no, great. Great question. Thanks, Dirk. It's yeah, very fair to say. And in fact, it was actually when I sort of reflect back again to, to my experience last May and you know, when I went to the event in the US and was surrounded by Ivy League institutions from across the US that we were sharing like Ubers with or you know having dinner with and talking about their experience using DET and like it was just a, a no-brainer. Obviously within the US context and these are all the elite universities you know in, in terms of choosing and selecting the DET as, as their primary test. Within that context of you know the US environment not requiring the English language test as a condition around the student visa. So the the premise of the accessibility kind of that online on-demand approach, the affordability of the test you know in, in comparison to other options and you know in, in the timeliness in, in terms of getting the, the test back within 48 hours were all things that stood out to you know these US institutions as, as really fundamental rationale as to, to why you would use it and and they were asking us kind of and, and the Australian contingent why we weren't what we've seen I guess in in Australia was you know, a rapid adoption during COVID, during the, the years of when they were locked down and, and particularly test centres weren't accessible. And so with that period, a lot of institutions, universities here in Australia uh, adopted the, the DET, the Dueling English Test, as, as their sort of fallback position. And, you know, where we've seen as sort of a lot of the COVID measures were unwound, a number of those providers then just reverted back to sort of the traditional t- um, test centre approach, which is understandable in, in terms of a well, well-trodden well route. However, you know, what we've seen is, and I, I suggest, you know, coming 
from my last sort of few meetings that I had over in, in Perth um, at the API conference recently. It was fantastic to see or hear from institutions which were talking about that cohort that had come through during that sort of those years of COVID now being able to be um, tested and tracked, you know, the in internal benchmarking tracer studies, which have, is validating that students that have done the, the DET were performing as good or better than other cohorts. We've kind of got runs on the board in terms of having students that have, have used the, the DET, but certainly the experience in terms of broad uh, adoption here in Australia uh, is below um, where we would sit benchmarked in, in, in other sort of comparative international education markets at the moment. It's a good point you make. And just, I mean, for those that aren't familiar with the duo test, duo can be taken by your at home behind your own computer. Is that right? Yeah, correct, Dirk. It's so it's a fully digital test. The test mm -hmm. itself was developed in sort of a, a digital environment and, and obviously yep. you know, leaning on the expertise of you know, our linguists and psychometricians and, and others from within the organization. When the DET was launched, it was always developed to, to break down those barriers of needing to travel to a test center, needing to book on online in advance. And within that, I guess we've been able to, to look at ways in which the tests could be operated differently. So within that differently, the, the DET is, is a computer adaptive test, meaning no two tests have ever been the same. So our, our bank of test items will, will validate that every student takes a unique test and the test difficulty will change based on how they're performing throughout the, the different items. Equally, I think some of the, the differences with the, the way the DET operates is um, because it's all done remotely and, and digitally, the test is recorded and, and that then sort of is distributed to one of our proctors globally, allowing us to deliver the results within 48 hours or, or an express version, which is within 24 hours. But each test is, is asynchronously proctored. So they always have a one-to-one -one proctor review the test and sometimes more depending on if there are any issues flagged. And so under that model, you know, it's different from what the traditional test center environment would look like. But the test is, is is equally different, and I think we need to sort of lean on those strengths when when we're talking about it. No, it sounds like a, an amazing methodology. In terms of security around fraud and ensuring that the student who's taking the test actually is the student that's taking the test, how does Duo go around about that? Yeah, Dirk, great question. So test security is obviously paramount, and you know, operating mm. in, in the digital environment, you know, we, we 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 probably have to come at it even harder than than others. You know, any any failure mm. in this uh, side would would sort of double down on on us. So test security is a, is a major component of the way in which the student needs to do their onboarding in terms of the ID that they need to provide physically, sort of digitally uploading. With the use of AI and particularly the, the features of security, you know, biometrics of the, the test taker, we have the video recording and there's a whole range of other online security features, you know, ensuring we don't have multiple devices running, having you know, the, the students when they onboard onto the test have to ensure there are no other you know, windows open in the background that could um, be operating that the students could, you know, I guess, be cheating uh, on the test itself. But equally, one of the really unique features is in the when we deliver the results and the students can share those results directly to their institution, the institution not only receives the actual score, but they actually will in their, on their dashboard get the, the written sample of, of how the student performed in their writing component. And they have a video of how the student actually performed in their spoken component of the test. So if any institution yeah, wow. wants to say, was the student the person that sat the test? Well, they can actually look at who sat the test. Yeah. There it is. And equally, you know, unfortunately, people will try and cheat the tests globally. You know, this is un, you know, consistent with all forms of any type of, type sure. of academic assessment. But with us, you know, if, if we, due, due to the biometrics, then you know, if a student tries to sit the test multiple times, then, then our security features will actually enable us to pick that up as well. So this, I guess in, in many ways, it's, it's an enhanced security function as opposed to some of the more traditional methods. What I like to see talking there, Brett, I'm just thinking how, how much incredible innovation can come out of that because when you're fully digital and you've got these amazing, you know, what did you say? What was the name of the um, role inside the organization? A psychometrist? Psych, 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 
Psychometricians, yeah. Psychometrician, thank you. I know <laughs> what it is, so I just can't pronounce it. But, you know, your data people, the, the linguists, the technology side, you know, as somebody that's sort of run my own businesses for, for 15 years, I get so excited about the unlimited options to just innovate and continue to move that forward because you've got the data to support it, you've got the knowledge, you've got the skills. All those things are just sitting there for you to be able to keep keep pushing things forward. Yeah, it's 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 just awesome to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I mate, I share your enthusiasm. Um, obviously, that was a, a a big part of the decision making process to to take the leap away from you know, what was an amazing role with English Australia, um, but equally, you know, to have the opportunity with this organisation. And in, in many ways, you know, things that we need to focus on here in Australia are around institutional engagement and sort of government acceptance. You know, I'm really confident with, with what the, the, how the test is designed, you know, the, the way in which we can back that with research and in terms of the other functions and, and features of security. It offers an incredible alternative. And, and as you say, it's, it's moving forward. We've got this whole adaptive environment to, to just keep progressing. And, and you know, but I, I guess... To be honest, Rob, the other exciting component for us, you know, here, whilst we've seen sort of the rise of the use of DET during COVID and then, you know, somewhat people you know, looking back or withdrawing from, from the use just based on, you know, I guess, what rollback of other COVID-related measures, our part of, the, part of our process at the moment is just re-educating. There isn't any barrier to any institution using the DET now. So, you know, through home affairs, it's not as though digital tests can't be used by students. And when we look at the reason why students undertake English proficiency assessment, it's either to meet institutional admissions requirements, you know, to, to prove that and, and validate that they're at the right level, or it's for a visa-related purpose. Now, in visa-related purposes, there are... So in, in that first category of, of validation of students' proficiency, well, the DET can be used... You know, across the board. In cases where the student visa requires a English language test to be shown as part of the visa requirement, so if the, if the genuine student or genuine temporary entrant or I think soon to be released genuine student uh, assessment requires the student to uh, uh, upload an English test, then at this stage the DET can't be used. However, there's an enormous number of cases due to low-risk institutions and low-risk providers where you know, it's up to the institution to, to validate the English language proficiency where the DET still can be used. And, and I guess in some ways we are you know, just working towards that process of institutions knowing when, when they can and, and at the moment when it's not feasible for the student to use it. But in, you know, in, in more cases than not, I think we'll, we'll win that argument and, and, and those aspects of that, that test security, the test validity will certainly, you know, come through with, with more institutions using the test as well. I hope so. I mean, choice is always good, right? That's that's my view. It's like, that's our system. More choice, more competition, always a good thing. So Absolutely. I mean, on the other side, you know, we will keenly be working with the government on government acceptance. At the moment, you know, there there is some barriers in terms of you know, a recognition of these new modern type assessment methodologies. But, you know, I'm confident that we're, we're seeing this change globally and, and I know Australia will be in that mix. And so I guess it, it's, it's really not a matter of if, you know, we will achieve government acceptance. It's just a matter of the when in, in terms of that process being able to be undertaken in, a, in sort of a fair and equitable manner. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be a process. Governments really do have to dot I's and, and cross T's. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm really proud. The, you know, the organisation itself it delivers thousands of tests globally to through different refugee programs, our access programs, working with other migrant groups. You know, we, we really do try to, to break down those barriers and support through initiatives like Talent Beyond Boundaries, mobility programs. So there's a whole range of other user cases outside of even the, the student visa program where you know, the, the DET is an ideal alternative for, for institutions and, and other you know, employers or, or work groups to be able to look at an English proficiency test. Yes, you said that just popped into my mind. Like, obviously, I'm, I'm from a learning abroad background, so we were doing the other side of the coin. We weren't bringing, we were sending students out of Australia rather than bringing them in. But every single one of those students going to a non-English speaking country could be on Duolingo. So 
I'm sure learning abroad practitioners are already talking it up, but imagine like that's the sort of thing that should be built into pre-departures and stuff too. I think there's heaps of opportunity there. So yeah, awesome, awesome overlap between, you know, technology and, and international ed. It makes, makes complete sense. Absolutely. No, it's, it's, it's exciting. And, you know, the app itself, it's just got some wonderful aspects in terms of the way that the, the whole process, the gamification, obviously, Rob, four years in or <laughs> potentially <laughs> nine years uh, down, um, I, I don't really need to, to, to speak too much around the, the value of, of logging in and, and yeah, doing yeah. Engineering the course. Well, Brett, it's been fantastic having you on. All the very best over the next 12 to 18 months with Geo and hopefully growing the business here in Australia and across the pond in New Zealand. We wish you luck and we look forward to having you hopefully back on in time to come to, to hear how it's all going. Yeah, thanks, Dirk. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. Great to be able to join you guys today. And and for any of the people out there listening, please feel free to get in touch if if there's anything you'd like to know more about um, Duolingo or the Duolingo English Test. Thanks, guys. As always, if you want to stay up to date with the international education news that's most important to you, the Koala News is your source of information, thekoalanews.com, which is where you'll find Dirk every day. You can get enough of Dirk, so (laughs) get on there, Koala News. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me, Dirk. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.